as we uh, finish a three-week series on truth. And what a better way to introduce the topic of truth, that uh, he died, he rose again, and he's coming back. Let's pray. Father, now as we look at your word, Father, I pray that you would speak truth into our lives. That, Lord, if there are those here today who, God, have just fallen for Satan's lies, if they have spiritual blinders on, that, God, those blinders would be lifted and they could see you for who you are and, God, for what you desire for each one of our lives. And it's all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's great to see you. We're on this last week of Truth or Consequences that we started, and, and uh, I just kind of wanted to recap real quick what the first two weeks, what we've talked about as we kind of close this, and, and the, to remind us all that we're in a battle for truth. I especially want to kind of recap, because it's the family service. We have the, the kids in here, and that's awesome, and so I want to be able to kind of bring them up to speed, so maybe at lunch today, you can have conversations about this, and, and here's what we all need to understand. There is a battle going on for truth in our culture today. And it comes in the form of two things, relativism and subjectivism. Now, those are fancy words. It just means this. There are people who claim that there is no such thing as absolute truth. You're going to hear that uh, in our culture today, that you cannot say that there's anything as such as, as an absolute truth. And subjectivism says this. Since there is no such thing as absolute truth, then whatever you determine your truth is then just embrace that and don't let anybody else try to impose their truth on you. We saw that in this battle for truth that ultimately it's a spiritual battle, that Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, that he has given us his word as a truth to live our lives by, but that there is a liar. The Bible says that Satan is a, the father of lies, that he is an expert liar, and he battles against the truth of God. And so there's this constant battle going on, a spiritual battle that is waged uh, between truth and lies. And the way that Satan lies, because he's such an expert liar, he will lie by giving a lot of truth mixed with a little bit of lie. And over a period of time, you wake up and you find yourself believing things that totally oppose the truth of God. In fact, Paul talked about how this was not, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. This was going on in Paul's day. Here's what he said in Romans chapter 1. He said, they traded the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Now, now here's what he said. You want to know whether you've fallen for the lie? Then answer this question. What do you worship? If you worship money, and, and what, what, what does it mean you worship? Well, what is it that you give the most, most worth to in your life? What is it that's ultimate in your life? That's what you worship. So do you worship money? Then you've fallen for the lie. Do you worship comfort? Then you've fallen for the lie. Do you worship power? Then you've fallen for the lie. Do you worship pleasure? Then you've fallen for the lie. We saw that last week, one of the subtle ones, the ways that Satan has made, a, you know, given, perpetuated this lie is this. There are many in our culture today who worship happiness. It's all about being happy. And if it's about me being happy, then that immediately makes me the center of my universe. And I can justify just about any act under the umbrella of happiness. And so last week we looked at that and we followed the logic. If we really believe that happiness is what it's all about, we followed the logic because the Bible says this, there is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end it leads to death. And we saw last week as we looked at it that if we think it's all about happiness, we saw how ultimately that could lead to destruction and would lead to destruction. And so in this battle for truth, today I want to build on what the choir just talked about. And I want to do that in Acts chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 22. And here's what you need to know as we set this up. Paul and Silas are on a missionary journey. 
And uh, as they're sharing the gospel, they have this lady who is demon-possessed, who is a first-century fortune teller, and she starts to follow Paul and Silas around. And believe it or not, the demon inside of this lady can't help but profess, these guys are legit. Man, what they're saying is right. That, that, uh, and you can read that later. And so it's an amazing thing, but they keep on... Uh, the demon and, and this lady keep on just following Paul and Silas and, and are just constantly shouting. And so finally, Paul says, enough. He turns around and he casts the demon out of this, out of this lady who was a slave. She was a demon-possessed slave, a fortune teller that was making money for her owners. So Paul turns around and he casts the demon out of this lady. Well, as you can imagine, the owners didn't like that because they were making a lot of money off of this lady. Uh, and so now that the demon is gone, she can't do what, what they wanted her to do. And so they get mad and they turn her into the governing authorities. Now understand this. This is a, a time whenever Christianity, the way, was stirring up all kinds of things, not just among the Jews, but among the Romans. Because now you had... Uh, believers who are saying, I will only worship and serve God. I'm not going to bow to Rome. I'm not going to bow to Caesar. And, and of course, we know all the, the Jews that, you know, you guys claim that you know the Messiah. So there's all kinds of ill will toward the apostles anyway. So Paul and Silas are brought in because they cast the demon out of the lady, but ultimately they brought in because they destroyed uh, a business. And so they brought him before the magistrates, and then we, we can see in verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Cyrus, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. Now, that's pretty severe punishment, but you have to understand the ill will that's going on here. And so because they have ruined these guys' business, a charge was brought before them, and they are beaten, they're flogged, they're brought into jail, and they're put in an inner cell so that it helps so that they can't escape, and they are put into shackles. And now notice what happens in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now think about that verse for just a minute. And think about it in light of what we talked about last week. If we really believe that it's all about our happiness and that if it doesn't make us happy, then God can't be behind it, then how silly is that compared to these verses, right? Paul and Silas have been beaten and flogged because they did the will of God. And where did it get them? It got them in jail. And he got them shackled. But were they belly aching? Were they complaining that they weren't happy? What were they doing? They were worshiping. Why? Because holiness trumps happiness. We talked about that last week. God allows things in our lives that, that, that he uses to make us holy. He's far more concerned about us living for his glory than our happiness. And because he wants us to be holy, he created us for worship. And he knows that ultimately worshiping him is the only way we'll ever be fulfilled. And so Paul and Silas are having this worship service in prison. And here's what blows me away. The other people, the other prisoners in there are listening to their worship service. And it must have impacted them greatly because look at the next verse. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Let me just say this. Here's a principle. It's a stretch, but it's a principle. If you're shackled by anything, worship will release those shackles. I'm just going to tell you, if there is anything in your life that has you shackled up, worship, and the shackles will fall. And so here's a literal earthquake. The shackles fall off. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Now look at verse 27. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Why would he kill himself? Because if he didn't do it, his boss was going to do it. When you were a Roman soldier, if you, lost a soldier, if you lost a prisoner, guess what? It was at your life. You lost your life if you lost a prisoner. So he thought, 
man, we've had this earthquake, all the prison doors are open, all the shackles fall, surely all the prisoners have left. I'm dead anyway, might as well go and do it myself. But notice what Paul says. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. And notice this next part of this verse. He doesn't say Paul and Silas are here, right. What does he say? We're all here. Do you get that? How powerful must your worship have been the night before? That prisoners, now their chains are dropped, the prison doors are open, they could walk out, but because Paul must have said, hey guys, just let's stay here. They actually listened to Paul, and it says all the prisoners were there. Verse 29, the jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he asked them what I believe is the most important question anyone can ever ask. And it's this, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that's the question I want to answer today. Paul's, uh, the jailer's question was this, sir, what must I do to be saved? And here's the answer. It depends on who you ask. Right? It depends on who you ask. Now, now, if this is your first time, hang in there, all right? Because you're going, oh, no, this guy's a heretic. Hang in there. Because I could give you the quick answer, but I'm talking about the way our culture works. Because here's the deal. If you were to ask, um, if you were to ask Dalai Lama that question, you would get one answer. If you were to ask a Muslim cleric that, that question, you would get a whole different truth, a whole different answer. Let me tell you, Billy Graham is not going to give you the same answer as Oprah Winfrey on what it, how am I going to be saved? What do I need to do to be saved? And so how you answer that question is ultimately so important, and in fact the most important, so you need to make sure you really know who you're asking. And here's how it plays out in America, just to show that we're so confused about this. In your notes, 53% of Americans believe that if a person is generally good, he will go to heaven. So if you ask most Americans, how do I get to heaven? What's the answer they're going to give you? Be a good person. So how do I get to heaven? Well, it depends on who you ask, because most Americans would tell you, here's how you get to heaven. You just be a really good person, and, and God's going to take you. In your notes, 43% believe it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow, because all faiths teach basically the same thing. So, so again, depends on who you ask. If I go to a Jehovah's Witness and ask him, how do I get into heaven? It's going to be a different answer than if I go to a Catholic and ask, how do I get to heaven? Which is going to be a different answer than if I go to a Mormon and say, how do you get to heaven? Which is a different answer than if you come and ask me, how do I get into heaven? And so just understand that. And then in your notes, 57% of evangelical church members, that's us, say that many religions can lead to eternal life. Now, I'm not sure the whole context of that, but, but we need to understand that we're going to get there that Jesus made an exclusive claim that there is only one way to heaven. But because of relativism, because of subjectivism, we, just, we can't even make up our minds on our culture today, even among evangelicals. So in your notes, let's look at some things, a few things I want us to look at. Just because you're sincere doesn't make what you believe true. Right? Just because you're sincere about it, I mean, let, let's admit there's a lot of people today who sincerely believe if I am a good person, God will let me into heaven. To which we have to say, just because you're sincere, it doesn't make what you believe true. But that is a major mindset in our culture today. As long as you're sincere about it, then it's okay. And, and let me make that point how that just doesn't play out. Anybody ever watch the, um, the tryouts for American Idol? Right? There are people on there who sincerely believe that they can sing. They sincerely believe that they have talent. Now, let me ask you this. Just because you believe something sincerely, does that make it true? No. In fact, as I'm watching that, some of the times the ones who are up there, I am just hurting and dying for them, right? 
And I'm going, I mean, I'm thinking, where are your friends, okay? And don't you have one person in your life who's willing to tell you the truth? Uh, that, that, you know, you're terrible. How in the world? But here's the deal. They sincerely believe, but that doesn't make it true. The second kind of foundational thing I want to point out is this, that there is truth in many religions, but all world religions can't be true. For example, most world religions believe that life is sacred. Most world religions believe that we're here to contribute something more to this world. Most world religions believe that something happens to you after you die. There's truth in most world religions, but all world religions can't be true. Just think about what happens to you after you die. There are some religions that teach this. After you die, if you did not achieve perfection in this lifetime, what happens? You got to come back and do it again. And what you come back at is, as is based on how good you live this life. So you might come back as a prince or you might come back as a mosquito. I mean, it really depends on how you did this time around, right? They have other religions who say, well, the only way to know what's going to happen when you die is you've got to die as a martyr. And that's the only guarantee that you have for, for eternity. There are other world religions who teach you've got to work really, really, really hard and maybe you may eke your way in. And then there's the gospel that says you have to put your faith fully in Jesus Christ and it's free and it's grace and it's mercy. And so we would have to say this, there is truth in many religions, but all religions can't be true. And then thirdly, discovering and living truth matters more than anything else. Let me explain it this way why it is so important for us to discover and live truth and to be able to answer that question that jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? Let's say that tomorrow you were gonna fly someplace and they bumped you up to first class. And you, you were sitting in the front row of first class and the cockpit door was open for a little while before you took off and you heard a conversation between the pilot and the co-pilot. So the pilot gets on, and here's what he says. He t- says to his co-pilot, you know what? I know when we were trained, they said that this button here was for pitch for the plane. But I'm not feeling that today. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this button here. The new truth is it's in charge of the temperature in, in, in the, the cabin today. And I know that they said, you know, that uh, this, this instrument over here was to make sure that we had uh, enough speed before we actually took off. But you know what? That's just, that's just not something I want to believe in today. So here's what we're going to do. Instead of that, I'm just going to go by my gut, you know. And, and when it feels right, then I'm going to start pulling up on it. And, and I know that there's a tower up there that's supposed to tell us when we can have clearance to take off. But that's their truth. I want to live by my truth. So we're just going to kind of take off when we want to, right? Now, if you're sitting in front of the cabin, what's going on in your mind? Now, let me take it one more step. Let's say that you, you have an episode, you go to the doctor, and the doctor goes, you know, everything that I see on the monitors and all says you're, you, you're having a heart attack. And, and, said, you know, and so he's telling you, it, it all says that you're having a heart attack, but you know what? I am tired of heart attacks today. And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to treat you for a brain tumor because that's just kind of what I'm feeling today. All right. That's kind of my truth today and, and all of that. Now, that's stupid now, Landish, but I'm trying to make a point, And that's this. In those cases, we would immediately go, no, there is truth. There is truth. And the truth is if the monitor says I'm having a heart attack, you better be treating me for a heart attack. If they taught you that this thing is what makes the plane go up and you have to have a certain speed, you better follow those truths. And man, we would be all over that. Why? Because it's immediate. It's urgent. And we understand that. Well, here's what we need to understand also. That the battle for truth affects you not just in this lifetime, but eternally. And you better know what truth you believe in. Because the consequences are not whether you're going to be treated right for a heart attack or not. But the consequences are where will you spend eternity? You see, that's why we call the truth or 
truth and, uh, or consequences. Because whatever truth you pick, there is consequences. And obviously, since we believe that this is the truth, then we believe if you don't follow this truth, there are severe consequences. And so let's talk about this truth. This truth is this, that Jesus claimed to be the truth. In fact, in your notes, Jesus, our truth. And let's look at the life of Jesus. He claimed to be truth. And, and so here's the question, is Jesus really true? Well, to do that, I want us to look at four things about Jesus' life. And ask yourself the question, is he the truth? The first is this, look at what Jesus taught. Now, I could have picked hundreds of verses in Scripture that show us what Jesus taught, how he taught, taught truth and love and grace. He taught the highest standard, but I chose this, these verses in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 29. And notice what Jesus said, but to you who are listening, I love that, all right? you got to listen to what I say, because what I'm about to say isn't, isn't what you're normally going to hear or think. So he says, to those who are listening, to those of you who are listening, I say this, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Look, if you take a look at what Jesus taught, no matter what you think about Christianity, you would have to admit the world would be a better place if we followed the truth that Jesus taught. Because let's be honest, those verses there are not my natural reaction. Not only do I not want to forgive, I don't even want to get even. I want to get ahead, right? I mean, because that's how I'm hardwired, and that's how most of us are hardwired, and yet Jesus, understanding that, teaches us truth. And here's what he's teaching us, that, that there is a way to live that we can live with joy despite circumstances. There is a way to live where we can live kingdom truth in our lives, and not only did Jesus teach this, but he lived it as truth. Now think about this. Our natural desire is to get even. But here's what Jesus, the truth, understands. That if we get even, it really doesn't make us any better. In fact, the way that we live this out is we learn to forgive. Because if we learn to forgive two things could happen. Number one, by forgiving my, and by living God's truth, I might change that person. Because here's what we know, hurting people hurt people. And, and so there's something going on in that person's life. If I turn the other cheek, if I pray for them, if I don't retaliate, if I truly love them back, you know what? I may change that person. They may see the truth of God because of my witness. And then secondly, Here's what we also know. If I harbor bitterness, if I harbor envy, or, 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 or um, if I am mad at people, it's destroying me. And so when Jesus teaches me to forgive, and not just to forgive, to pray for, he's doing that because of my best interest. Now let me ask you this. Would the world be a better place if we lived that way? Absolutely. Absolutely. And let me also ask you this, compare that to to other truths, other claims of truth, and ask yourself, did Jesus really teach truth? Second in your notes, look at the miracles Jesus performed. If you want to know if he was the truth, well, look at the miracles he performed. Look at Mark 6. It says, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man uh, get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom uh, what has been, that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Scripture tells us of the miracles that Jesus performed, that he opened the eyes of the blind, that he healed the deaf ears, that he caused the mute to speak, he turned water into wine, he healed the sick, he multiplied the loaves and fishes, and he even raised the dead. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but here's an amazing thing. Who were his biggest detractors? Who were the people who most wanted Jesus out of the way? It was the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. But you know that Even his enemies, 
the scribes and the Pharisees never once claimed that D Jesus didn't do the miracles that the Bible says he did. Now think about that. When they wanted Jesus out of the way, they never said, well, he's claiming he's doing all those miracles and he never did those miracles. No. Why? Because he did those. Those things really happened. And if, if Jesus didn't perform the miracles that the Bible says that he performed, well, they would have been the first ones to bring that up. And so then you look at the miracles. What did Jesus, what kind of miracles did Jesus do? Well, he did things to help people and to advance the kingdom of God. When you look at all of his miracles, it falls under he loved people and he advanced the kingdom of God. Can we be honest for just about two minutes here? It's, we're in church. It's Sunday morning. We can be honest, okay? Here's the deal. If you had the power Jesus had, would that be the only way you use that power? You see, Jesus used that power to help others and to advance the kingdom of God. If you had the ability to... Um, to perform the miracles Jesus did, how would you use that? No, oh, maybe to win the lottery? Uh, maybe so your boss would be sick uh, three days a week? Um, maybe that the kids would make perfect straight-A grades or, or they would always obey you? Or how about this one? If you had the ability, okay, my spouse is now going to look like and fill in the blank, all right? Whoever that is. I mean, let's face it, we... I don't think any of us would be the way that Jesus, would, would display miracles the way Jesus did. He used his power to do two things, to love people. So he cast out the demons. He healed the sick. He brought sight to the blind. He made the lame man walk. And then he advanced God's kingdom. He fed 5,000 and 4,000 with fish and loaves. So look at the miracles that Jesus did and ask yourself, is he the truth? Third, look at the cross and the resurrection. Jesus left heaven, took on flesh, lived among us, was beaten and, and went to the cross for our sins and our sins were placed on him on the cross. We call that substitutionary atonement. The, the punishment I deserve because of my sins, Jesus took on himself on the cross. He was buried and he rose from the grave on that third day. And here's how Peter said it. He said, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Peter said, we saw him. And look, I've had people give me all kinds of excuses why Jesus might not have raised, been raised from the dead on that third day. Some people will say, well, you know what, Chuck? I just believe the Roman soldiers took his body. Well, well if you believe that, that's kind of a dumb move, all right? Because here's the deal. Because a small group of believers believe that, in fact, over 500 believe that they encountered a risen Savior, they turned the world upside down. They, they caused a movement that started uh, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. And they caused a bunch of heartache for the Roman uh, government. If the Romans had taken Jesus' body, if the soldiers had taken his body, don't you think that whenever the movement got started, they would have presented the body of Jesus and said, gotcha? I have others who say, no, the apostles probably took Jesus' body and then made up the story. Really? I think that's tougher to believe than the Roman officials. Why? Because the apostles, all of them, died as martyrs because they wouldn't stop preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and, and people don't die for a lie. They were willing to give their lives because they so believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The other part, Peter is writing this, and he's writing to a crowd that, that whenever they heard it read, many of them were still alive. And if Jesus had not risen on that third day, there would have been people who stood up and said, that never happened. But the opposite of that happened. As this was being read, there were people saying, I was there, or my parents were there, or I've heard stories of people who were there, and I had relatives there. And because of that, it affirmed the story that Jesus rose from the grave. What other truth can make that 
that claim. In fact, look at Luke 24. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. I don't know anyone else. There is no one else in history who called their own resurrection. Jesus said, here's the deal. I'm going to die. But three days later, I'm coming back to life. Jesus is the truth. And then lastly, look at what Jesus claimed. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So how do you answer the jailer's question? Well, the answer is this. How do I know eternal life? How, what must I do to be saved? You must put your full trust in Jesus Christ because he said he is the only way. When you make that exclusive claim, Josh McDowell says it makes you determine one of three things about Jesus. When Jesus said, I am the only way to the Father, and it's an exclusive claim, you have to believe one of three things about Jesus. Number one, he was a liar. That he was a liar, that, that he, he said things he shouldn't say. But, but let me just say this. Think about this. The only way that Jesus could become the way was through the cross, through the crucifixion and the resurrection. If Jesus was lying, I think about the time they started beating them with the cat of nine tails, he might have changed his story. But he didn't because he knew that he had to go through that for us and for our salvation. Josh McDowell says either he's a liar or he's a lunatic. Now, there have been lunatics who have, who have claimed many things. There have been lunatics who have actually died because of certain claims, but there's never been one who's lived the life that Jesus lived. When you look at the life of Jesus, you would have to say that's anything but a lunatic. So either he's a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And he is who he says he is. And his truth is true and we need to follow that. In fact, one day Jesus was walking along, and in your notes, look at this. He turned to Peter and he said, but what about you, he asked, talking to Simon Peter. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that's the same question Jesus asked of every one of us. Who do you say that he is? Who do you believe that he is? And let me tell you, with this battle for truth, Satan is going to try to convince you that God is not good. He's going to try to convince you that you can't trust Jesus. He's going to try to convince you that if you give your life to him, your life will be boring. And that's where you've got to determine your truth. And Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But then here's the other truth. He says if we put our trust in him, we'll have eternal life. He says if we put our trust in him, we can have an abundant life. If we put our trust in him, we will have a forgiven life. If we put our trust in him, we will have purpose in life. But you've got to determine what truth you're going to follow. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Hi, I'm Jason Smith, the campus pastor for our Lakeside Campus, First Baptist Church, Windermere. If you've been touched by this morning's message or if you would like to talk to a pastor or have more information about the church, please contact us at our website at www.fbcwindermere.com or please feel free to call us at 407 876-2234. Thank you and may God bless you.